Take your sword, gird it now upon your side. Ride prosperously, come rain, and rain, rain over me. Come rain, Jesus, come rain. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus. <laughs> you know, things would be a lot cooler in here if we had somebody who had the understanding and the knowledge to hook into a 460 current. So everything's there. All the provisions there. Sitting right there. Brand new. Brand new, huge. Just nobody knows how to plug in. Just nobody knows how it works. We have a concept of it because we can make that work. And so we're very proud of ourselves. But right now, uh, we would actually rather have the air on than the light on. Yeah? You can be seated. And Father's not telling nobody. He's not telling anyone. He's not telling anyone. He's already told us all. And he's and he set forth things and conditions that we've not been willing to meet. And because we've not been willing to meet them, we're just playing around with the realms that we know, or where we're functioning in the realms that we know. And though there's so much more, everything, everything that we need, all the blessings, all the comfort, everything that we need is right there. It's available. All we have to do is understand how it actually works. Everything in God, there's first and foremost, Father gives a revelation. Let me show it to you just within the framework of salvation. When you gave your life to Jesus, I'm going to make it really simple. God in His mercy and His grace gave us enough revelation and enough influence of the Holy Ghost to begin to pull and tug upon our hearts to where that we knew that we needed to get right with God and that Jesus was our answer. We just knew God gave us a faith knowledge that although it was so, I mean it's the most unseen thing that we've ever experienced that if we would just do these certain things like from the heart, call upon the name of Jesus, we would be miraculously transformed and safe though we had no outward proof of it. All we had was a sense of it. God did something and gave us a sense of it. Understand this. Now, now listen, listen. God gave a little bit of revelation. And then, come son. If you're going to be up there, come do it now or otherwise come sit down. Listen, God gave a little bit of revelation. There, was a, there had to be a response of obedience to that revelation. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. Listen to me. Here's what happens. Happens with me. Happens with you. And you can understand how it happens more or less based upon how people function. Sometimes a person just steps into one dimension of the glory of God and with just one little bit, one little teeny bit more than everybody else has, suddenly it's called an explosion of God's grace and power. God gives to us a revelation and then there has to be an act of obedience. With that act of obedience comes more revelation. The, and it's a revelation that comes out of relationship because Father's not interested in anything else. He's interested in touchy, feely, deep heart, passion, emotion stuff. To, listen, I tell you, I think that one of the hardest things that people have to get rid of is their attraction to man. And they're trying to please man. And, and, and they're stuck in a prison, and I call it a prison of self-consciousness. What do people think about me? What do they, you know, how are they going to receive me? How do you feel about me now? That is a prison. When all of that suddenly gets directed towards the Lord, all of a sudden, we begin to interact with Him in the relationship that He demands, and it's reciprocated. It's, uh, no, there is no such thing as rela relationship without a reciprocation. That is a place that your heart will only allow you to go through obedience. 
Fathers, open up the door. The opportunity is everybody. He says peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. And I'm going to tell you what peace is. It is the absence of condemnation. That's why he says peace to those that are near and peace to those that are far away. He says, come on in. Peace with God means that though you're unworthy and you don't have the right and you should be an outcast, you get to come and sit down and eat with them. That's the peace offering that was eaten in the Old Testament, which ultimately is the only offering, the continual offering that represents the Passover offering, which is the closest thing that we have to communion offering, which is fellowship offering, our fellowship time that we have centered around the communion table. For a long time, I used to just keep a, a... a cup of grape juice up on the platform and I would walk around eating a piece of matzah and drinking because I just wanted to let everybody realize that that's far more than the ritual that we made it it is the symbol that we are living by him his very life is in us and that this life is how we live and and, and the sweetness and the and the strength and the, what bread does for you when you're hungry and even when you're not, it satisfies something that gives you energy, gives you strength, gives you, gives you the ability to function in the natural way. Well, there's heavenly bread. I mean, listen, in the wilderness, they were able to live off the manna that came down from heaven. And, and, and Jesus said, look, you didn't get the true manna because that bread was just going to last you for 24 hours. I'm going to give you the bread that lasts you for, for ages, forever. A, a bread that feels you, touches you, puts in you the very life of God. When that happens, you become so captivated with God, it doesn't even matter what the rest of the world thinks. Therefore, you can suffer persecution and rejection. You can stand in the face of the enemy. You can stand in the face of darkness. You can stand in the face of everything that would come against you doing the will of God. People don't realize what they're doing in a human realm, under the human condition, as they try to drag everything down into something that they can comprehend and interact with with their taste buds, with their sensual realm. Father's calling, Father's beckoning some people to start living in a realm called heaven in a greater way. I've been living in a realm called heaven. I'm talking to you about a realm called heaven for just a little bit tonight. I want James to share some too. James and Debbie's here. James and Debbie Levesque. And, um, you know, I, I, I love both of them so much. God's just allowing, being allowed, been being given permission by James to do something through his life. And he's just waiting for us to give him a little bit more permission. Permission. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, huh, to think that we would give God permission. Oh, no, it's a sovereign act of God. He did the sovereign act. He did sovereign act. He's done it. And the sovereignty of God is that the Holy Ghost is here continually. There is a manifestation of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost given to every single person so that we may profit with it. Huh? Listen to me. Come on now. Come on now. I'm going to profit tonight. I, I, I was telling a dear friend of mine today, I, I, I said, if you, in all honesty, if you took the description of the Word of God and the fruits that God demands and you superimpose them against the Christian life, there is really a great short fall. We've been assimilated into the world system. We've been neutralized by the world system. People, people get all excited that, and think, well, you know, there's some kind of, you know, special group that's running finances. Listen, dear people, that's no news. Look, Satan has been doing it for a long time. He's trying to get Jesus. see him take the whole world there and he controls e- every dimension of economics for the single purpose of being able to tattoo people as the, his slaves uh-huh. that's been going on a long time and I'm afraid that too many people got the tattoo already are you listening to me too many people got the tattoo already it's not a microchip that somebody slips into your, under your skin I think somebody's lost their brain their mind it has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with it God has given to us the ability. Christ Jesus came and liberated us from the prison of this world. And he said, friendship with the world is an act of hostility against him. It's an act of hostility against the kingdom. If you're going to be a friend of the world, you are the enemy of God by default. That's what James said. It's pretty radical stuff, James. 
We have got to recognize our call and our position that we've been given to come stand on Father's side. I don't want to, I don't want to throw it all on the negative side because everybody's just constantly on the negative side, wallowing around in the misery of being under the con constant influence of a demon spirit. Let's come on over here and recognize that we can continually be baptized in His glory. Tonight we were singing something that is real to us. It's real to me. I will show forth your glory. Jesus showed forth his glory when he turned the water into wine and he showed that the way that the elemental system of the world works isn't as men thought. He showed forth his glory when he raised the young man at Nain from the dead. Listen to me. Jesus said, the same glory that the Father gave me when he baptized me with the Holy Ghost in fire. The same glory when he baptized me with his Holy Spirit without measure. That same glory, I've given it to to you and actually he said to the father it was like he was informing the father oh by the way father the glory you gave to me I'm giving it to them so they can be just like us just like us that's what the scripture says some people want to say well it says that they may be one even as we are one um, same thing just like us and then he makes it very clear that he's not talking about your unity with me and my unity with you because that that is, a, that is an afterthought. Thought. That, that is a, that's something that happens as a, as a result. You can't have oneness with me until you have oneness with my Father. We can't fellowship. We can't hang out. It just doesn't gel. It just doesn't work. Huh? You know what I'm saying, right? There is a company of the redeemed, man. And God is calling all men into it so that you can have this sweet fellowship. People are earnest. Well, I want to hang out with you more. I want to have fellowship with you more. You need to hang out with Papa. You need to have fellowship with Papa. Somebody was telling me, yeah, oh, but we... <laughs> men need wives. Wives need husbands. That's secondary and you've made it primary. What's first is you being willing to come on over and know what life is all about because you're trying to interact with life while you're dead or have some shadow of death. Papa's calling us into a wonderful realm. I don't want, to sh I don't want any shortcuts. I don't want to go up any other way. I'm not looking for any alternatives. I'm not looking for a quick fix, quick answer, quick remedy. I don't need nothing but him. Some of what God the Father has purposed to do through my life is going to happen while I'm in this body. But the majority of what Father is going to do through my life happens when I leave this body and I receive a heavenly building and a heavenly tabernacle made of God, made by God. And then I will behold Him as He is, for I will be like Him. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I will have in my life, I will have upon my life the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and a new name which he would give me and only I'll know it. Ha, <laughs> Jesus. And so will you. And you have to decide, well, just what am I living for? Do I, want, do I want to step over and begin to interact? Father gave us an opportunity that, that, that Samuel didn't have, that Moses didn't have, even though Moses did things that Enoch, you know, I... I, I, I I almost refrain to say that Enoch didn't have it or Elijah didn't have it. I know why Elijah got so upset and ran to Sinai. Because he actually thought that the Lord was going to set up his kingdom there on, on Bethel when the, when the contest went down. Because he knew he was the end time prophet. He knew he was the prophet that would prepare the coming of the Lord to come rule and reign over the earth. He understood that. But he didn't realize he was going to get caught up into heaven for 2,600 years and have to wait until this appointed day and appointed time. I want you to think about that you are actually living in one of the greatest moments in the history of the universe, in God's plan for man. And with that, you live in the greatest oppositions because now religion has adopted the name of Jesus Christ and there are so many fair speech men who are able to influence people with a power that is, defies logic. And then not only that, or that, not only is that running interference, but now you have the entirety of the world system 
that by and large the church has been assimilated into and didn't hear what Jesus said when he talked about the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the pleasures of this world and said clearly, look, look, God's seed, God's seed works, okay? His seed produces. But he said if it's in stony ground, if it's on the wayside, hard ground, fowls of the air gets it. He said if it's in stony ground, what happens is it springs up, but then it can't endure persecution. It's going to compromise. It's not going to necessarily go all the way away. It's just going to compromise. You're over there at that church. They're crazy. Man, did you hear them speaking in that tongues thing? They were even singing. Paul said, what should we do? We'll pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Spirit, and we'll pray in the understanding of us, just sing in the Spirit. I can't help it that I'm just having the same experience that Paul was talking about. Somebody said, you're doing it because the Scripture says to do it? Yeah, that's a great reason to do it. A lot of things that have happened in my life, they've happened, and then I've discovered in the Word that it's okay for me to do it. Because the Holy Ghost and the Word of God agree. And they never disagree. And one always is backing up the other. Hallelujah. One is always testifying of the other. People, God's calling you into a place of relationship to be able to walk with Him. And I could say, I could say just tonight, I could say every bit as much as Enoch did. I could say every bit as much as Elijah did. And I could say every bit as much as Moses did. But what if I said every bit as much as Jesus did? Ha! <laughs> and I'm going to have to ask you, do you believe that Jesus had a greater relationship, had a greater access with the Father, had a greater understanding of the things of the kingdom than, than was going on with, with Enoch? Who, he didn't know it, man. People don't believe this, but I truly believe it because I see it written. It's imprinted on him. God imprints stuff on us when we're born. It's in us. He separates us from our mother's womb, some of us. And he imprints us with a divine mission. And you can see it in Enoch who prophesied that the Lord would come with ten thousands of saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds which they ungodly committed. He was right there at the juncture where man was about to reach a finality in God's mercy and grace upon their sin and iniquity. And he, and he was raptured up, taken away, caught away for a single purpose. Some people, and I'm going to say this, some people don't realize that the word rapture is in the Bible. I hear people say it's not in the Bible. That's nonsense. It's a synonym to caught up. You can translate the particular Greek word that is used many times throughout the Bible, rapture or caught away equally. So people who are, it's amazing how people try to beat their drum of their particular preference and blame it on God. But so I just want you to understand, when I say rapture, I'm saying a biblical word caught away. He was caught up and Father reserved him now for over 5,000 years to come back. Somebody said, well, it's Moses. Well, God can do anything. He can work any miracle, but Enoch's never died, so. <laughs> okay, could Moses die twice? Sure. Sure. I just think that Moses, I personally believe that Moses already got a resurrected body. Because, and I'm going to tell you why I believe that. So I'm just going to, I like to shock people at least one time in the night. Okay. This is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is, I, there's no scripture for this. I'll let you know right up front. This is my personal opinion. I believe the Moses already has a resurrected body, and I'm going to tell you why. When Jesus rode from the dead, many of the patriarchs and saints were seen walking around with him in his resurrection. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. No one was raised from the dead uh, uh, until he was, but the first resurrection, I serve you notice, started 2,000 years ago with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's a great come, and, and the rest of us, we know that we're reserved. And Paul, Peter, Paul told us that we're reserved, so I'll make that very clear. He said, for us to die, to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. He said, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, I have a tabernacle in heaven. It's something that is made of God. I will not be naked. I'll be clothed. So there's something that's going to be, we'll, we'll actually be able to have while we're waiting for the resurrection of the day, the dead. Because he said, he said that, the dead in Christ, at the last trump, the dead in Christ should rise first. He said, we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are dead. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured, together with him in the air. Okay? So we know that right now, you know, there's, a, there's clearly a, a, a scriptural evidence that uh, an event took place right there with Jesus. Hallelujah. Some graves shook open with him. And everybody else is waiting till that day. And that's that day, that day I want to talk to you about tonight. Because you, people, if you don't know how to live in heaven now, you won't know how to live in heaven later. I want you to understand. 
If you don't know how to receive from the Holy Ghost, I want you to understand something. How are you going to hear or receive from the Holy Spirit the moment after you breathe out your last breath? You know, there is no sanctification in the sepulcher. There's no unique process of salvation that happens the moment that you die. It all takes place right now. God has made a way for you and I to have a transformation of life, a complete change. God's not looking for something that is a partial uh, change because repentance by definition is the most radical declaration of change. It's the new birth. It's, that's how radical repentance is. It is to be converted, to be made a new creation, to be made a new creature. And then people want to hang on to the life in this world and they say, well, how about my life in this world? The Lord said, hate it. <laughs> and then furthermore, he said, deny yourself. And I, I find over and again that when I interview people, they cannot even begin to tell me how they truly, measurably deny themselves on a daily basis. And it got all, it got all you know, uh, wrapped up in a bunch of religion through the dark ages, so to speak. And, but we're still in the dim ages. <laughs> and, and, and people did crazy things with that idea, but that nonetheless doesn't take away the potency and the demand that we're supposed to deny ourselves, take up daily... Uh, people just want to look. People just say that people just want to act like, oh well, you know, I, I, I'm I'm going to die because they misunderstand one verse of scripture says where Paul said, "I die daily." I, I protested to rejoicing. I die daily, and he was talking about the fact that his body was corruptible and going to the grave because ultimately it was in the context of the resurrection, and he was arguing the point that the resurrection had happened. Are you with me? Do you, do you know the Bible well enough to know where I'm speaking from right now? I hope you do. I'm actually referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at, the, at this juncture. But listen, I want you to understand something. I want you to hear something. It's very, very important for you to grasp this. Right now, at this very moment in time, Christ Jesus lives in me. God dwells in me. God Almighty is in me. He's in my spirit and my soul and my body. In every part of me. In my thoughts. Ha. Ah, in my mouth. His word should not depart out of my mouth. Or out of the mouth of my seed. Or my seed's seed. That's the new covenant. Ha. Ah, Sikado mosi again a kid. And then he says, he would be expressed through me. He said, I'm not going to be like it was. It's not going to be like it was in the days of the old covenant. When I took you by your hand. I'm not going to take you by the hand instead of you and help you and balance you. I'm going to walk in you. I'm going to breathe inside your body. I'm going to move through your feet. And then the, Paul goes on to say, we his purchased possession. Therefore, we're supposed to glorify God in our body, our soma. <laughs> the, the Gnostics hate that idea. Glorify God in your soma, in your body. Uh, because my body is holy. It's the temple of the living God. It's not some vile, filthy thing. It's glorified as his dwelling place. It's pretty radical, isn't it? But see, reality of it is, is our, the Old Testament roots has no concept of a vile body. It has, it has rather the body being literally the members of God. Huh? It's something that is sanctified and set apart and which God's glory is manifested through as it was upon Moses' face when he came down from off the mountain. It wasn't until later that on when, uh, when Greek theology and Greek ideology got mixed in with Christendom that people began to believe there's something vile about the body. I mean, Paul used the word this vile body or he said it really, he didn't use that word as it is, you see it in King James and that's really what I meant to say. He, just, he said, this corruptible body, huh? This perishable body. It's a perishable, perishable body. Somebody said, if I could be divested of my body, then I wouldn't have temptation anymore. That's not true. It's not an idea that's conveyed to us by the Word of God. <laughs> Father has invited us over into a place to where that every part of our being is saturated with His presence. To be baptized in the Holy Ghost, to means the best thing that you could possibly imagine. It means to be pickled. Pickled. Hallelujah. Every part of your being saturated with the presence of the Lord. <laughs> tonight, tonight, 
It's a very difficult thing for people to imagine in this place how hard it is for you to hook up with what God's done. You can do the 110, but you can't do the 460. And Father wants to take, it, Father wants to take you to another place that will demand great humility and brokenness. It, it, will, it will demand self-denial. Because self-denial is really, it's fundamentally about this one thing. It's about you not doing your will anymore, but doing Father's will. And that's difficult because we're busy. We're busy, Bubba. We're busy. We got to get up. We got to go to work. We got our hearts set upon our mortgage and our, and our riches and our things. And then we hold on to the attachments. We call things ours. We possess it. We brag about it. We find our self-worth in it. We find our identity in it. I dare say that a lot of you would radically change if all of a sudden your occupation became a, a dumpster diver. A person who worked for waste management. You would begin to actually hear God more than you've ever heard Him in your life if you worked for waste management. Because if you, if you, if, too many people draw their identity and their self-worth out of what everybody says about them. You know, how am I doing now? Am I doing okay now? Am I preaching good? Am I okay? Do I look good? Do I... Did you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I know? There's this, all this thing that we're, we're going for the affirmation and the praises of men. And God says, look. And you know, it's a wonderful thing when we were able to discover how hooked we are on the praises of men. <laughs> because, you know, the, the Lord Jesus has a lot to say about that in John chapter 5. And I'm not going to go into that. I'm just really dealing basically with some of the things that hinder us from being who God's called us to be and receiving all that Father has given us and living in sickness and disease and sin and sorrow, being wrecked. Instead of having beauty, we got ashes. Instead of having oil of joy, we got mourning. Instead of having the mantle of praise, you know, spirit of heaviness. People walk around depressed all the time. I, I, I know too many preachers that are telling me, look, Mark, you wouldn't even believe it. Everywhere we go, we just see a bunch of people with sad faces, sad countenances, and they all say that they're baptized in the Holy Ghost. So that's deception. And I have to say, well, you know what? I know what you mean. I have some of those people I have to deal with too. I had a number of people leave the, leave the church because they said that I put... I was demanding things of them that went beyond my rights. I was demanding of them to be happy. <laughs> I was demanding them to have a glorious, happy countenance. You should have seen the hate mail, the emails. How wrong I am to expect that people should have the oil of joy. That they should have everlasting joy upon their head. Here's the problem. See, you can't have that legalistically. You can't have that out of human effort. <laughs> you can't have it. You can't have that out of your own self-derivations. You can't derive that from yourself or from things around you. That's something that's given to us by the Holy Ghost. And it's supposed to be expressed in an inexhaustible way out of our bellies. I mean, I mean read a couple of verses of Scripture to you here. We send some shockwaves through the building. I'm living in heaven right now. I'm living in the kingdom of God right now. We're the first to be allowed to participate with his rulership and his governorship. Paul said in Colossians 1.13, we're translated out of this world into the kingdom of their son. Peter went on to say, if we give all attendance to the disposition and the culture of the kingdom of God, which by the way, in Isaiah 61, the Lord Jesus describes the culture of the kingdom of God and the result of having been set free by his authority. Just remember that. I want you to remember that. Because if you can't read Isaiah 61 and see your face and see your life, there's a problem. I look in Isaiah 61 and I rejoice because I see me. I go, yippee. I see me. I see me. I don't see myself based upon some kind of esoteric, just claim it by faith. I see myself. This is actually happening in my heart, in my life. I have the testimony, the witness of the Holy Ghost. Somebody says, would you come and be a witness to my character? Would you come and to write a letter to the court and tell them I'm a good guy? Would you come and, 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 and let these people over here know, that God, that I, you know what God's been doing in my life? Listen, there is a better witness. 
God wants you and I to have the witness of the Holy Ghost. He wants us to have the witness of the Word. He wants us to have those things that we read about. And so that's why Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said that we are supposed to give all diligence to making our calling and election sure. And he's talking about those things that, he, that Jesus named when he preached at the, at the, on, on, on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7. He's talking about the disposition of the culture of the kingdom of God. <laughs> the culture of the kingdom of God is unity, not discord. It's love, not hate. It's peace, not condemnation. <laughs> It's meekness, not being self-willed. I can go on. And of course, Peter said, I'll do my very best to stir you up as long as I'm in this tabernacle putting you in remembrance of these things. Because this is what it's all about. Now, I'm going to talk to you here tonight about smashing stuff. Crushing stuff. Huh? When they said, baby Anna. When ba they said, baby Anna has strep A, which is a, 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 actually a, a methicillin a resistant type of strep, strep A. You can't treat it with antibiotics. And she was already messed, you know, just one thing after another. And when you could say, I smashed you, Satan. No, that works really good in that context, doesn't it? And of course, that echoed down the halls of that hospital when I screamed it out. I smash you, Satan! Now that came right out of my belly, right out of my heart, right out of the authority that I have in Christ Jesus, for Jesus is in me. Huh? They went back and did another test and it wasn't there. And then they were all uncertain as to what was going on. It doesn't matter. You know? Fact of it is, is here she is. She's just as healthy as she could be. But now, but now, but now, but now, if I start talking about sin, uh-oh, uh -oh, it isn't so impressive to say, sin, I smash you. You foul spirit of hell, trying to, trying to create within me a treason against the Most High God. That doesn't ring out so well. Because we just don't like the sin... We're, we're, we're angry at the sins that we don't like, like rape and murder. Pedophilia and homosexuality. Today, the UK, there's a movement in Parliament to recognize pedophilia as a sexual preference. Next, it's I've got to have my goat and whatever else. But we've opened up the box with homosexuality. Okay? Okay, so a man can have a man, a woman can have a woman. So why can't a grown man have a little boy and a grown woman have a little girl and a man have a goat and maybe his cow? Who knows what's next? Maybe it's even going to be a chicken. Who knows? You know, where does it go down? I shouldn't be deprived of my right to be able to whatever. I'm telling you, it's weird. And there's no end to it. And you say, well, these words aren't even, these words aren't even uh, acceptable to utter in church. I'm going to utter them. Because I'm telling you right now, the sin you like is just as bad. The sin you like is just as bad. I said, the sin you like is just as bad. The strife you like is just as bad. The envy, the evil speaking, the guile, the nonsense, just as bad. Jesus didn't even, Lord didn't even talk about adultery and fornication and homosexuality in the wilderness. He just talked about murmuring and complaining. He said, I swear in my wrath that the work was finished from the foundation of the world. Though I decided long ago that it was already settled, I changed my mind. You're not coming in. <laughs> and I tell you right now, I want to make heaven. But more than that, I want to live in heaven right now. <laughs> because making heaven's in the future. I say more than that, I want to live in heaven right now because that's right now. I got the privilege of being able to have all these wonderful things that God describes to us about this life that is only in existence in Him. Life is a wonderful and a beautiful and a glorious thing. <laughs> and you can't find any of it in the world. It's all death in the world. And any assimilation or any, any interaction with it only, plague, only causes you to come under the influence of a disease, a plague called death. See, spiritual laws, the spiritual laws of life have come to us and we're taught every day by the Holy Ghost, our mentor, how to walk in the spiritual laws of life, how to observe them. 
how to have insight with them. When you teach somebody physical laws, Newtonian laws, laws of, of physics, if they develop, if they develop their skill set and their perceptions well enough, they can do great things within the framework of the natural world, like shoot rockets into outer space and land on the moon. Crazy, crazy, amazing things. What happens when you get into the spiritual laws of life? There's far more to the spiritual laws of life than we've been able to recognize or willing to recognize. You know, and I see the first one exemplified at Jesus at 12 years of age. He said, I'm, I must be about my father's business. Why did you look everywhere for me? Where are you going to find me? In church. And therefore, he defined being in church, being taught the word of God and teaching the word of God as father's business. Spiritual laws of life. Are you ready? Are you ready, to, are you ready to make a clean break tonight? I pray in Jesus' name that you will recognize that the captain of your salvation has gone before you. And he learned obedience to the things he suffered. That's what Jesus did. He, being the captain of our salvation, learned obedience. <laughs> wow. I reckon you and I ought to. He was, he was declared to be the son of God by the spirit of holiness and power. There's a spirit that is in the world, and it's the spirit of disobedience. The Holy Ghost has come, and he's the spirit of obedience. And it's time to be led by him. It's time to be taught by him. Time to be governed by him. Hallelujah. And I hope tonight that you can hear everything that I'm saying in the midst of the love, the love of God. I hope you can hear everything that I'm saying tonight in the midst of grace. It's the grace of God. See, it's the grace of God that brought salvation and teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live righteously and godly. And then, what a privilege. I'm learning how to live in heaven. I'm learning how to live out the ways of God. This is the ways of life. We, we, we think that the ways of, of this world and the ways of the satanic are better. We're going to have more fun over there. It's going to be a party. We're going to go out and do whatever. But it's just death. That's the law's of sin and death. Through <laughs> Christ Jesus. <laughs> We've been brought into this wonderful realm to be taught of God now. That we don't even need we don't need anybody to teach us this one simple thing. Listen to me. That you and I are to abide in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to listen. Are you listening to me? John 15 describes two different types of branches in the vine. They're both in the vine. They're both in the vine. They both were born again. They both became a part of the life of Jesus Christ. They both received the invitation. One bore fruit, the other didn't. The one that didn't bring forth fruit, God said he took it and cut it off, and it was cast away and burned in the fire. He said the ones that do bring forth fruit, he says then he purges it so it can bring forth more fruit. He cuts it back and tends it. He's a good husbandman. He knows how to grow stuff. But he tells us very clearly that we can't, we've got to leave the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, pleasures of this world. Otherwise, we cannot bring forth fruit unto perfection. That's what he says. So tonight, if you're not bringing forth fruit unto perfection, if fruit is not being brought forth unto perfection in your life, you're going now to be willing to let the floodlight of heaven shine upon your soul to show you the compromises that are going down in your life. And what will happen is the Lord will begin to put restraints upon your life because you allow them. And then if you start speaking evil or violating something in the spirit, it'll grieve you so deep and vex you so deep. It won't be about any man's opinion. It won't, men don't even come into the equation. Are you with me? And then if a man of God, someone anointed of the Lord tells you, you need to change. You're not going to sit there and, and, and sass them and, and, and have a bad attitude and take a spirit of offense and run to your car mad. See, you know, the Lord used me in the word of knowledge, but it's not a sensational way. It's not an insati sensational, imp impressive way. It's more in dealing with the things that need to get right. And a lot of times people don't want to get right. The light shines, but the light, right, light comes and reproves of the wrongdoing, <laughs> of the evil. <laughs> and I, I, if you and I are going 
to ultimately step into the things that God has for us. Let's look back at the revivals of old. And let's look at the holiness preaching. Let's look at the fire and brimstone preaching. Let's look at the fear of God preaching. Let's look at sinners in the hands of, the angry, of an angry God. Shake you to the very core. E e Evan, I mean, uh, um, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Great awake, first great awakening in America. No, people, modern day people can't even relate to that. They can't even relate to that. Go read it. Listen, I, go read it. He just read it. He just read it. And the spirit of the living God shook a nation. People read that and they're not even touched by it today. They read it, not even touched by it. It's like, what? Huh? This did what? What does that mean? Could that mean something? Could that be telling us something? Could the warnings that were given by the last generation of prophets have not been heeded of us falling deeper and deeper into a place of not being able to hear the voice of God or respond to the anointing because we're so stuck in our religious ideology. That's what happened to the Pharisees. We, we, you know what? We talk bad about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but my goodness, these guys were devoted to going to church. They were devoted to the Bible study. They knew the Bible better than anybody else. My goodness, they probably knew the Bible uh, better than, than most people sitting in here, if not everyone, even the modern counterparts today. And their hearts were so far from God, they could not recognize Jesus. They thought that Jesus was the devil. Huh. And I don't look at that and go, man, those guys are just messed up. I go, wait a minute. Papa, pops, father, have mercy on me, Lord. Touch my soul, God. I need you, Lord. Come protect me. Come heal me. Come keep me. Come correct me. Come instruct me. And then with all, with, because I don't want to fall in the same snare. How can I walk around... Saying, well, I'm right. And I'm sure that I'm right. If I don't have the word of God giving me witness and the Holy Ghost giving me witness. Huh? I just get, so we cry out to God and the beautiful thing is he answers. And out of that, there is, something's worked in our spirit. And, and it, listen, it is, listen to what's worked in our spirit. It's a giving all attendance to making our calling and election sure. Huh? It's saying, wait a minute, I want to be right here. That description of what God described in his word, I want to be that. I want to be the person that's got rivers of living water gushing out of me. In other words, rivers of the expressions of God gushing out of me. I want to be a person who's able to profit from the giftings of the Spirit in the context of the church. I want to be able to hook up with the anointing. I'm not going to sit there with a sad countenance. If I had a sad countenance, I would say, well, I must not be saved. And I wouldn't just give up. I'd, grab, I'd, I'd fast and pray, do whatever it took to get rid of whatever demon spirit was harassing me and causing depression or physical disease. People, some people have a physical disease of depression. And, it cre and you know, it creates sorrow. The, prob the, the issue is God has called us over into a place where there's an inexpressible realm of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. Look at, listen to this. And meekness goodness, I mean goodness rather, could you imagine living goodness all day, and faith and meekness and temperance. And it's more than that. There's, I count 26 fruits of the Spirit in the New Testament, 26 fruits of the Spirit. Like boldness is a fruit of the Spirit. A assurance, confidence, fruits of the Spirit, things that the Holy Ghost supplies to us. He describes what it looks like to be a new creation, someone who now has the Father living in them. Who, they're abiding in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is abiding in them, and they bring forth the fruits of the relationship. How these things of the kingdom of God and the culture of the kingdom are manifested through their life. And so we see the Lord say that we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And when we begin to understand that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, joy. Joy is one of the chief characteristics of the kingdom of God, Old Testament and the New Testament. The Lord gave Israel over to their enemies because they would not worship him with rejoicing and gladness of heart. <laughs> That's pretty radical, isn't it? Huh? Why don't you stop and just flow in the joy for just a minute? Why don't you just stop and just feel the presence of the living God just overwhelm you? 
And you could have, somebody said, well, I, I'm just not really happy right now. I've been through a lot of things today. Exactly. And it keeps you from bringing forth fruit. It chokes the word of God that it cannot bring forth fruit. It chokes you. I've been through a lot of things today, and it chokes you. I've been through a lot of, because they don't know how, people don't know how to allow the river to flow through them and wash away all the things that a daily experience of being in this world would try to fix to their, to their lives, to their thoughts, because people offended you, they hurt your feelings, things didn't work out like you planned, and most of that was a plan that you had that was purely earthly and about yourself, had nothing to do with the kingdom of God in the first place, but it has the strings of your desires and affections and heart and emotion, and you need to get some Holy Ghost scissors and start clipping them every time you feel the pull, so that you're not earthbound. Come on now. Say, Karamasikingalaya, Mongalaya, man, I'm an Akarosia, Nanea, Taya, Sabakuya, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to me. I'm going to talk to you tonight about smashing it. I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about smashing it. Smashing it. Okay? I'm talking about going after the things of the kingdom of God, this life in Christ Jesus, to where that everything that is an offense, every, anything that doesn't belong in God's heaven, anything that doesn't belong in His holies of holies cannot be in your life. And if it comes out against you, you're going to smash it. Okay? I want you to catch, I want you to think about that. Anything that's done in the Holy Souls, anything that's done in the kingdom of God. Peter said, we look for a heaven, new heaven and a new earth wherein will dwell only righteousness. That's all we want. There's not going to be any kind of sin there. <laughs> not going to be any kind of iniquity there. And there's not going to be sin and iniquity in hell. Somebody said, I'm just going to go to hell so be with my friends and we can party forever. No, you're all alone in the, mix, in, in the midst of, of a mass of humanity. You're all alone. In a darkness that calls you to gnaw your tongue. In a flame and in a fire that has just as much of an effect as it does now upon the human body. But it is not quenched. But the, and the soul will not die. And that's just as real. That is just as real. The torments of hell is just as real as the bliss of heaven. People don't want to believe it. The torments of hell are just as real as the bliss of, he bliss of heaven. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's the perception of men. The, th the people you like, they're going to go to heaven because you like them. I liked Robin Williams. He's going to be in heaven. I liked Elvis Presley. He's going to be in heaven. I like this one and that one. And they just rank Full of the devil sinners that God said his wrath abides on them, but you want to be in heaven. And Aunt Holy uh, Sally, who had her mouth, uh, 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 you know, against every person that was anointed practically, I really loved her. She's not in heaven. She's just in hell with everybody else. Huh? Now, the people you don't like, who don't you like? Charlie Manson, hell. Huh? Who else? Saddam Hussein, hell. Gaddafi, hell. Who else? Anybody you don't like, hell. That ain't the way it works. Ain't the way it works. Jesus said, unless you're born of the Spirit, you can't enter into the realms of the kingdom. You can't step in. Now, he's telling us to seek after the things of the kingdom. And I want to just real quickly, real briefly, show you things of the kingdom real quickly on another scale. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Ha. Huh. What am I wanting? What I'm wanting, what I'm wanting is I'm wanting Holy Ghost conviction to hit people so hard. I'm wanting the fear of God to overwhelm people so much. I'm wanting a consecration and a commitment to touch people's hearts so radically that God, the Holy Ghost, now has permission to bring forth the things that we read about in the New Testament concerning His church. I'm tired of the stinking mess. And you try to correct people, and all they do is take offense. And you hear about it. It's nuts. And Papa's going to sort it out. Papa sort it out. He will. Because it's everywhere. It has nothing really to do with, well, it does have something to do with the preachers. But I really think, by and large, the Laodicean church has ultimately produced the preachers that it has. It's just that some people like me aren't going to bend and aren't going to bow to the will of men. Because I'm too busy doing the will of Father. And when you want the will of Papa, you know what? You'll like the way I preach. Amen. You'll like the things I have to say. Everybody else is going to go their own way. Do whatever it is they're going to do. And they all sit around in a corner and talk about how bad I am. That's fine. 
Bottom line of it is, I just hope, I'm praying, believing God, that they'll pick up their Bible. Pray you pick up your Bible. Uh, you know, you've heard me say this before. I'll say it again tonight. I would, I would just remind us a person earlier today. Listen, what you ought to do is spend two months in, in, in the Apostle John's church. Spend two months in his church. Don't read anything except for first, second, and third John. First, second, spend two months in, in, in John's church. It changed you. Then go spend two months in Peter's church. First epistle and second epistle. I've done this. I mean, I, I've, I, I gave myself, it changed my life. It changed your life. To where that all you know about God is what John says in first epistle, first, second, third epistle. All you know about God is what Peter said. All you know about Jesus is what Peter said in first, second epistle of Peter. Come on now. These are the apostles with the Lord Jesus. I figured they knew what they're talking about. Somebody said, oh, they were stuck in legalism. No, they weren't. It changed you. Change you. And it would have changed you on, on, the, on the level of saying, wait a minute, Lord, I want to be conformed in every way, Lord Jesus, to you. I want to do, Father, what you have purposed for me to do. Jesus, you came and liberated me from the prison of this world being under the, the yoke and bondage of sin so that I now may learn how to walk in righteousness and holiness. Somebody told me, he said, well, why do you, what, what, what do you believe all this is all about? What do you think sanctification is all about? I'll tell you what sanctification is all about. It is being consecrated to live the life of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, then why won't people do that? Why not? Come on, let's do that. Come on, let's do that. Come on, let's do that. And that's going to first be have, have its effect on the way you interact with your wife. And I have no tolerance for men who scream and holler at their wives. Or for wives who scream and holler at their husbands. Or for women who rebel against their husbands. Or for men who won't lay down their life for their wives. Because fundamentally they deny the faith. I was saying a lot of people had a gifting opportunity in their, in their life, but their wife was a rebel, a stinking rebel. And that neutralizes the gift of God on any man's life. He's not allowed to flow in the Holy Ghost. God says, give him a Bible, let him have a pulpit, and nothing's going to happen. Are you listening to me? This is radical preaching. Does my dial 911? We need some help. Get your placard. Go march around. Because I'm just preaching to you the Word of God. Because when you begin to have the reality of the life of Jesus Christ, the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost in your life, principally there's love. Hallelujah. There is a servitude love. God is a servant. I'm telling you, people try to imagine him in the context of grace. You can't. Because he's more of a servant than grace could ever demand. He's more forgiving and more full of mercy than grace could ever define. <laughs> he's a servant. He's almost like can imagine like a little child. If you tell him he goes for it, okay. You say, I'm sorry, Lord. He says, look at Ahab, he's repenting. He didn't say, oh, I don't think that Ahab is really serious. I'm going to look into the future here and see what he's going to do. He said, look at Ahab, look at he repents. He took it for what it was right then. He didn't look into the future. What it was right then. If you looked into the future, Ahab was backslidden in a couple of weeks. He took it for what it was right there. The most wicked king who had turned a nation against Father, led them in rebellion against him. And he says to Elijah, go, go tell Ahab. I repent for what I determined to do against him. Pretty amazing God, isn't he? Well, I'm not taking advantage of him. I love him. I'm going to take advantage of my girlfriend, my wife. I love her too much. I do anything for her. I love her more now than I ever loved her. <laughs> and she doesn't, she doesn't rate being hollered at, screamed at, oppressed, beat down, put under. Huh? Come on, man. Come on now. There's wrong examples in the church. People running wide open, supposedly running wide open for the kingdom of God, so they're so stressed out, and then their loved one's got to take the rap? Nonsense. I don't believe that. It's a problem with their spirit. There's things that are wrong in their life. Are you listening to me? Because the flow of the Holy Ghost begins at home. 
And then right after home, it's seen in church. The kingdom of God, in other words, the culture of the kingdom of God is first witnessed at home. My children need to witness it. Every, the, the greatest heartaches that I have is any memories that I can think back and, and realize that my kids did not see a witness of the culture of the kingdom of God. And I pray, oh God, I know they saw more of the culture than not. And I pray that they will do it far better, more perfectly than mom and I did it. But we're devoted to this thing because it's not just an idea. It's not a way of life. It's not just some kind of concepts. It is the reality of everything that is good and wonderful. It's what's in the heart of a papa. It's what's in the heart of a father. It's what Jesus came and showed us. I'm telling you people, this, he's far more worthy to serve than Satan. You hear most people tell it. That the disobedience, the effect that Adam had on man is greater than the effect that Jesus has had on us. That the transgression of one abounds more than the obedience of one. That Satan has more influence and power upon a redeemed man than God the Holy Ghost does. And I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. It's nonsense. It totally it, it, it nullifies all of that theology. Somebody's got to rise up, put a trumpet to their mouth, let their light begin to shine, which is the very life of Jesus Christ. He's the light that's shining now unto the nations. That's who we are supposed to be. <laughs> We're supposed to be the restorer of the, uh, of the paths of dwelling, the breach repairers, the, those, the, those who build the ancient ruins. <laughs> The ancient, the, the place, uh, the, the habitable place of the paradise of God that became a wilderness. Because <laughs> we've been brought back into that realm. But if, you don't, if you're not willing to comply with Isaiah 58, look at Isaiah 58. You know all it is about? Pointing the finger, talking bad about people behind their backs. Talking bad about the anointed and, and the ministry. That's what Isaiah 58 says. As long as you put forth the finger and the lip, the sticking forth of the lip. Huh? Which is an action of disgust towards somebody else. <sighs> honor, not despite. The culture of the kingdom is honor, man. It's honor. It's honoring even the least among us. Seeing not them after the flesh, but after the spirit. Not knowing any man after his natural birthright, but after his heavenly inheritance. You see. Well, here's what I know. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to, I'm going to shout to this mountain until it becomes plain. And I've already, you know, I've already paid the price. I'll continue to pay the price. It does not matter. You can say whatever you want to say. Bottom line of it is, there is going to be, there more, more happens as we declare the word of God that framed the heavens than this is taking place in the small little region of this room. And when men begin to lift up their voice and cooperate with the Holy Ghost, it has an empowering impact upon all those who would. It has an effect in the realms of everything that men know. And it's because it's like the act, it's like the living act of whatever you bind on earth will be bound by Father in heaven. Whatever you loose. Uh, the preaching of the word, though it's foolishness, God took foolish things, like the foolishness of preaching. To show forth his power and his glory because that's how he does things with the power of his word through weak vessels. I ain't come here tonight with anything except for the Holy Ghost and Jesus. I didn't come here with an agenda. In fact, in my mind and my heart, I was more going to just have James share about all the things he's doing, God's doing through him. He's going to be here on Sunday sharing, so... I'm just desperate. I'm, I'm desperate. I go to bed desperate at night for the move of God. I go, to des I go to bed desperate saying, Father, look what you did with Wigglesworth. Look what you did back there with John G. Lake. Look what you did with Alexander Dowie. Look what you did with Evan Roberts. Look what you did back there. Lord God, the increase of your government, of your kingdom, there's no end. Lord, I know that this is the day. This is the critical moment of time. Father, I know that a great sovereign removing of your spirit, a great wave of your presence is about to overwhelm the souls of men again. Father, let let me participate with it. Let me know what's in your heart so I can do it with you. If we just know what Father's doing and doing it with him, we're on. 
And his word's telling us what he's doing. That's wisdom. And the word of wisdom is ever been as powerful, if not more, <laughs> than the word of knowledge. But, you know, I'm not going to rank things. Father, touch my baby right now. I know she's hungry. And she's growing quickly. And I pray that everybody in this church desires a sincere milk of the word that desperately. That persistently. Come on, mama. Come on, feed me. Come on. Come on, I'm hungry. Oh, let me have some more of that sustenance, more of that, the elements of life. Can you hear it? I do all of my passionate expressions, all of my deep desires and desperations in my conversation with the Lord. Because there's nothing in this world that thrills me. Nothing in this world that moves me. Everything that belongs to the lust of the flesh is an offense to me. It grieves me. It's like stabbing me with a knife in my heart. Everything that belongs to the pride of life. It's, a, it's another realm to me. It's a totally contrasted realm to me. Because I've been born of the Spirit. I've been washed in the blood. I'm taught of the Holy Ghost. God's calling people to come out. From among them, be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. I'll be unto you a God. You'll be my people. I'll be your father, and you'll be my sons and my daughters. Come on, man. Somebody said, that sounds like legalism. No, I'm not trusting in the law of Moses for righteousness. It's not having anything to do with legalism. It's all about love, man. I know about love. Love is faithful. Love is obedient. Love is reverent. Love doesn't take anyone for granted. Love is full of respect. I'm, come on, man. Love is full of servitude. My goodness, I get to be Father's servant. He said, I'll be your servant. I'll wash your feet. Sit down. If you won't let me serve you, if you won't let me take care of you from head to toe, you can't be a mind. Huh? Peter says, Peter says, wash me from head to toe. Jesus says, no, foot's not good enough. The feet will be good enough. First, Peter's not going to let Jesus do anything for him. He doesn't realize he can't do anything without Jesus. Ha, pa, pa. He said that. You can't do anything without Jesus. Listen, it's been in my heart <laughs> since I can be, remember. All I want to see is Jesus. I'm just here to see Jesus. Turn with me to Daniel. Where's everybody going? Changing room. He had one of the best spots in the house. Good things being reserved. I just want my, I just want my kids and, and, and my family to be constantly under the Word of God. Listening to the Word of God. Captivated by the Word of God because that changes everything. The Word washes. The Word establishes, builds up, strengthens. The Word of God brings security, a great defense. The Word of God abides in you. You'll defeat Satan at every point. But you've got to obey. You can't just sit there and be hearers of the word, not doers. You've got to do it. And in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. I want you to listen to me. Which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I want you to go quickly with me to Psalms chapter 2. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance. I will give you the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron. 
and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Go with me to Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. I'm talking about you and what's happening in your life right now. I'm talking about you and what you allow in your life right now. I'm talking about you and what you're doing right now. Listen, we are being trained by God to rule and reign with Him forever. I hope your lessons went well today. Because if you look at what you're supposed to be doing, you'll begin to understand. If you look at the position and place of responsibility, this is the ministry of Jesus. You'll begin to recognize that there can be nothing belonging to the realms of rebellion and disobedience allowed in your life. If you think that you're going to stand and rule and reign with Jesus, people say, oh, I'm going to wait to get to heaven, then it's all going to be over. It's all going to begin. Saying it's all going to be over just as your own lack of understanding. It's all where it all begins. It's where we just are back on track with Father's original plan for our lives. Hallelujah. Revelation 2, 27. Listen to this. I'm going to start at verse 26. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And to that person, listen to this, and that person shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. As a vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. To, 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 they will be thrashed to shivers. Even as I received of my father. Go to Revelation chapter 19. Hallelujah. Verse <laughs> And of course, the psalmist said, who is this that comes from Bozrah? The prophet said, who is this that comes with Bozrah, from Bozrah with his garments dipped in blood? And that's the Lord going to Bozrah, which is, which is, the, which is now a rock, heap, a, 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 a rock heap, just a rubble heap of rock. I'll get it out. But, but we know that it will be a, a nation that the world will wonder at before that day. And he will go there and execute his wrath before he ever even goes to Armageddon. Okay? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the one with his eyes a flame of fire. He says, comes with his vestment dipped in blood. Okay? Verse 12, his eyes were a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. Praise God. And he had a name written on that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goes a sharp sh sword and with it he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress as he treadeth and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty I want you to understand that all of Father's wrath is directed at one thing. Sin. Disobedience. And so tonight, I want you to be willing to participate with me in recognizing that the battle line has been drawn. Everything that people are running after, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of this world. Hey, they that have the love of the Father in them don't have a love for the world in them. <laughs> We're at war against it. 
And there's only one way to be successful, to be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. And, and, I, and I, want that, I want that battle line set for you to where you stop justifying. Satan is a master of his craft of deception. Quit justifying wrongdoing. Quit justifying any kind and form of sin. Become militant against it. Smash 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 it. The Lord said to, the Lord says this. He says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, lest your prayers be unheard. Huh? Come on, man. You, you can shut yourself off from heaven if you don't dwell with your wives according to knowledge. The Lord says, his eyes are open upon the righteous, but his face is against them to do evil. That's what he says evil is in that context. Keep your tongue from speaking bad things about someone else and your lips from uttering any kind of discord. Well, my father's very interested in relationship. You know this? Understand this. Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. Father is more interested in relationship than any single thing. Listen to me. He's interested in relationship. First with him and then with everybody else. More than any single thing. And that's why he's going to put these heavy things on this. He said seven things, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven is abomination. And the seventh goes on all the time. The seventh goes on all the time, and it goes on all in the context of supposedly, I don't know, protecting people, trying to, you know, spread the bad news or whatever. One who sows discord among the brethren. One who speaks guile. One who brings another person's character into question. Now there's various hierarchies of that. The leadership God has anointed to speak on his behalf, which is him. He's coming, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. There is one level with that. There's another level with the way that things go down between husband and wife, parents, and children. There's another level that goes on with the people of the household of faith. There's another level that goes on with people that you interact with in the world. Come on now. I want to see a Holy Ghost revival. I want to see the light of God shine. I'm tired of sin and leaven being welcomed in the church. Of course, it's not welcome down here. I said, Father, well, what about these folks that, that, that they won't change? Right? They come, they listen, but they won't change. They don't change. They, you know, the Father is always encouraging me. Well, I'm still dealing with them. But why, why stay in the darkness? Why stay in deceived? Why not let your eyes pop open? Somebody said, how's that going to happen? Let me tell you how it's going to happen. You're going to obey. You come under the rule. You come under the rule. You need to come under the rule. The rule of Christ Jesus. Do you hear me? You come under the rule of the Holy Ghost. Come on now. In Jesus' name. Everybody, would you stand with me? Just stand with me. I know it's hot in here. A little bit challenging for some folks. I'm going to get you to heaven. If you'll obey. The scripture tells us, how will they hear without a preacher? And how is there going to be a preacher unless he's sent? I'm here. I was sent by God to this place. I was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ to this place almost 35 years ago. I was sent here by the Lord Jesus Christ. I stood in this place and I prophesied for 32 years. Older than, you know, longer than a lot of people are, have been alive in this place tonight. Nothing's changed. It's just, gotten, it's just gotten more fiery in the spirit. If I walk up to you and I tell you something by the Holy Ghost, why would you rebel against it? Must I give you the address? That, you know, tell you what your, you know, your driver's license number is? Give you some 
word of knowledge that's not possible for anybody to know except for God, and then you're going to believe? That's a hard heart. Don't be hard. Don't be calloused against the Lord. Just, just let you, tonight, just, just, just tonight, just do this tonight. I want you just to consecrate yourself, to engage in this wonderful privilege that we have of walking out a relationship with the Holy Ghost that makes all of this exciting, fun, and wonderful. Because when it becomes fun, exciting, wonderful, you're not going to be walking around sad looking like you lost. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to be upset or overwhelmed because of, wow, man, we got all these things to do. Now, let me tell you, you got one thing to do. Stay in the fire in the presence of the living God. Walk it out with Jesus. That's one thing to do. That's one thing to do. Huh? Walk in the Spirit. And you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh, which fundamentally says, walk in the Spirit and you will not sin. Walk in the Holy Ghost. People don't make it hard. Don't make it hard. God gives you peace tonight. Peace. Peace to those that are far away. He says no condemnation. <laughs> I, 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 refer, I release you from condemnation. Those of you who sin with the lips, be cleansed now. Those of you who sin in any other area, be cleansed right now in Jesus' name. Those of you who are sad and depressed, be full of joy now in Jesus' name. Be filled with joy right now. If you're sad and depressed, lift your hands towards heaven and be filled with joy. There's more people sad and depressed than that. What happens is I just, when I do this, I see and discover people who are totally oblivious to their state of being. It's true. Because if I say, you, see, I'm going to give you the best way. If I say, if you're sad and depressed, lift your hands right now and be filled with joy. There's got to be one of two things. Either they are unaware of their state or they're disobedient and rebellious. So I'm not going to go with the second one. I'm just going to go, they're unaware of their state. Huh? So how can God ever change you? Because you won't, you won't, you won't, you, 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 you what? Right? So I, I say then, okay, Father, in your mercy, let revelation come. Okay, well, how does revelation come? Are you with me? The Lord says that if you're His, you're going to be joyful. That should be revelation. Right? You're going to be happy. You're going to be blessed. You're going to shine as a light unto a lost and dying world. So just lift your hands if you're sad and depressed. Now lift your hands if you're not sad and depressed. Hallelujah. So whatever condition you're in tonight, I want you to be blessed. I want you to be refreshed right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Hallelujah. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yo! Hallelujah! Thank you, mighty God! Thank you for your presence! <laughs>
Just think, just think about the possibility of not being stuck no more. Just think, just think about the possibility tonight of not being stuck anymore. <laughs> So no matter where you're at, no matter maybe 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 what's been going on in your life is miracles to the extent that there's you can measure a lot of great things, but there's never been the activation of raising the dead. But tonight you're not stuck anymore. You actually get to step into that realm. Think about maybe you've just never really understood how that can you live in a continuous flow of His joy. But tonight you're not stuck anymore. You don't have to live there anymore. Think about tonight where you potentially that sin continually comes and overwhelms you and it captivates your heart and your affections. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. Tonight, you don't have to be stuck there anymore. I'm telling you right now, the power of the living God is present no matter where you stand at this moment to change everything about your realm of living the dimension of relationship that you have with Christ Jesus increases. All you got to do is be hungry. You don't have to settle out for the same thing. Sunday night, I was in here, I mean, breaking off every unholy alliance. Breaking off alliances where people who know how to move in faith have hooked up with people who don't. They're just full of doubt. Those alliances have to be broken. Unholy alliances are where people who hooked up with things that are wrong, sin, evil, bad, unholy, not of God, something of this world, something of the cares of this world, broken. Listen, I'm telling you, there's absolutely no way things can be the same. I'm telling you, Satan rises up and tries to stop things as soon as you begin to do this. But all you have to do is be persistent about it. Say, no, it's broken. It's done. It's over. It ain't going to be going that way no more. It's the beautiful thing about, about what God has done for us. He's brought to us. The power of change. Power of instantaneous change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing of the past has any right or claim on you at this very moment if you just say, I don't want it. I'm done with it. If you just cry out to God with your heart, everything changes. I'm looking at three million souls. I'm, I'm looking at three million souls that are weighed in the balance based upon my decisions right here in San Diego, California. I'm looking at three million souls that are weighing the weight, weighing in the balance of whether they spend eternity in hell or in heaven based upon the decisions of this church. The stuff isn't just about you and about me and some casual little preference and idea that we may have concerning the way church ought to go down and the way we ought to live our life. I'm talking about revival. I'm talking about cooperating with the move of God. I'm talking about coming into agreement with the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be radical about it tonight, just dealing with your heart to surrender to God means that you don't hold on to anything about yourself and your own opinions anymore. Just let it go. 
Don't hang on to anything that would condemn you or hold you back or cause you to feel guilt. Release whatever unforgiveness you have right now. Release whatever thing that, that, that's going on in your life that makes you feel like you can't move forward in God. Let it be released right now. Let it go right now. I said let it go now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Kira masa karanea. Yes, honey, you want to say? Huh? Come on, today. My lapel. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 4 18. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mandate for us, church. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. <laughs> Just like Pastor said, there's three million people in our backyard here in San Diego, and most of us are going to go to work tomorrow, and we have been given this mandate. <laughs> to heal the brokenhearted, if we would just yield to the Holy Spirit, if we went into work and just spent a moment with him in our car before we get out and hear from him a direct word, like the word Pastor heard about Brad and now Brad's whole family being in the church. The Lord wants to use every single person in this church tonight. That's not a coincidence that you came to hear the word of the Lord. And I pray that you would staple this Luke 418 on your heart tomorrow. And that we would see captives set free here in San Diego. <laughs> in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, as, we, as we're getting ready to close, I want to deal with every spirit of offense. Christ Jesus wants to manifest his life through you, and first and foremost, with his love. He doesn't look upon anyone with the wrong attitude. Or something that they hurt you or made you feel bad or whatever. Or didn't do something that you wanted them to do. That's a prison. And I release you from the prison right now. But you got to want to be released. I want you to forgive from the heart right now anybody that's offended you. And then I want you to let God, the Holy Ghost, so fill you with love that out of your belly flows kisses. flows deep affection for them. I want you to find a bunch of people right around you right now. I want you to hug them. Tell them that you love them. Deep affection.